this may be controversial. As a writer, do you have any pet peeves when it comes to grammar? I have so many. I'm very particular about grammar and writing in general, but a few that stick out there, there, and there, when people don't use those properly, mm -hmm. I feel like my brain just starts glitching out. And your and your, like yep. your TV versus you are buying a TV, that also annoys me a lot, but I'm going to take it in stride. All right, I was gonna ask, do you feel compelled that you just have to say something and correct it when you see it in an email, let's say? No, only if, I will only correct it if I'm being sarcastic and I'm talking to like a really close friend or family member, or if obviously if it's for a client and I'm working with a team member on it, then I will make corrections. Other than that, you live your life. I won't say a word. Okay, maybe you can answer this question for me because I have seen this both ways and I thought I knew the answer. And now every time I do this thing that I'm about to share, I question myself. Does the comma go in quotation marks or outside of quotation marks? In my opinion, it goes in the quotation marks. Right, okay, that's what I thought. But I've seen it outside of too. Why have I seen that? I'm not sure, I see that too. And sometimes it almost looks right, but I will never stop putting the quotation inside. Oh, I feel so validated. <laughs> I've been wondering, like questioning everything. So storytelling is a huge part of your journey, which we're going to get into a little bit more in a bit. But somewhere along the way, I noticed that it morphed from just written to also visual storytelling. You have been and probably still are a photographer. You got your degree in film. Where did that transition happen? I don't even know if there was a transition. So I mean, if I rewind all the way back, my childhood is what motivated me to even study film. I picked up a camera for the first time when I was nine or 10 on a family trip. My parents just handed me my first digital camera and I don't think I set it down for years after that. To me, they've always just worked hand in hand. I've always loved storytelling. I started writing stories from honestly the minute I could write as a kid. And I was always also a fan of visual mediums. When I was growing up, I would watch movies, a huge movie buff family. I mean, it's a little bit excessive, but it also explains where my love for movies comes from. And so I was always really passionate about that combination between written storytelling and how that's communicated on screen or in front of people in a theater or whatever the case may be. They always walked hand in hand for me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite movie or like a top three? <laughs> As of today, I will say my top three are, that is a hard question. So for context, I'm really bad at this because okay. immediately my brain goes to, well, what genre? Like, what mood am I in? Who am I today? It like, what do I want to watch? It can vary. But I'm really enjoying Abigail, which is like a comedy horror movie. Okay. It's a little campy. Horror is one of my favorite genres. Comedy, it's hard to make me laugh in a movie. And I think they just do a really good job of combining the two. And then I would also say The Tree of Life. It's a little artsy, a little pretentious, but I just think it's beautiful. And I just keep rewatching The Big Short lately. They do a really good job of educating and informing you along the way, but it is so well written. The cast is incredible. I, I love that movie. So I need to go back time. and watch that. It's been several years. And the other two you just added to my to-do list over the weekend because I have Ooh. not watched those. I think it's interesting and also good to hear that your family seem to encourage this exploration of storytelling from an early age, regardless of that support, do you think you would have done something in the art realm? Or do you think that really was yeah. influential in the path you took? That's a really good question. I think that because they gave me so many opportunities to lean into the artistic side of myself, it opened my eyes to all these different ways in which I could express myself artistically because I also come from a very type A family. Everybody in my family is an accountant or they work in HR. There are a few campus ministers, not a lot on the art side. So it could have gone the other way. I could have <laughs> just been right. told to put the camera down. So I think them giving me those opportunities to express myself, even though I thought I was a little bit quirky when I was a kid, I do think it let me see what I could accomplish. Regardless, by the time I got to college, I would have just done it anyway. The way they ended up supporting me in college was I went in as undeclared, did not know what I wanted to study. And then I went to see this movie with some of my hallmates that first week. 
And I completely just lost myself in the movie and realized that's what I wanted to study. It made me feel the way I felt growing up. And when I told my parents, they said, that's fine, you can study film, but you're tacking on something that will help you get a job. So <laughs> I minored in something else. So I think having that balance was really crucial, but I probably would have done it anyway. What'd you minor in? Spanish. <laughs> they okay. wanted like business administration. A Spanish language. was not what I was expecting. <laughs> It's not what they were expecting either. I mean, that's a good skill to have. Have you utilized that Spanish degree at all? Sometimes. If I'm working with a client and they have an international audience, mm -hmm. it's come in handy. And I am fluent, so that's been really nice. I want to dive in a little bit more to your family being accountants, like more type A, <laughs> and how you took this creative path. Do you think them having that experience has helped you feel more confident taking this entrepreneurial route, even though you yourself didn't get the degree in business? Or have you truly learned all of this on your own and found other mentors outside of your family that could help fill the gaps for you in those areas? So a mix of both. My older sister, who I've always just looked up to, I think she's incredible. She does own her own business. So I do see her as an inspiration in that regard. She's built a very interesting niche for herself in accounting and financial education. And I've gleaned a lot of insights from the way she's built that and navigated obstacles along the way. But outside of that, I would say it's been a mix of mentorships and kind of building the plane as I fly it. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm really grateful for though, is as a marketer, there's value in being really data-driven and analytical. And there's also a lot of value in creativity. The way I was brought up is what really empowered me to combine the two. I love data. I love reports. I'm actually very clinical a lot of the time, which a lot of people don't expect when they talk to me or look at me. But then I use that data to inform my creativity. And those guidelines are what let me actually spread my wings for lack of a better phrase. That's probably made you really successful starting your own business. So to get into that a little bit, you've had your own photography, marketing, retail companies before your most recent venture, which we'll talk about verbatim in just a minute. How do you think about building a strong brand reputation and a client base early on when you're kind of starting from scratch? When I was in college, I was obviously studying film and media. I was in the honors college, so nobody else was really studying like, a creative field. It okay. was a lot of what I'd grown up around, but I ended up having a lot of friends who started nonprofits. Obviously at the same time, I was doing photography on the side just for fun. And as is the case with nonprofits, especially new ones, there really isn't like a budget or a strategy for marketing yet. You just have a really strong mission and vision. And so I started helping whoever I could and then realized okay, but the marketing piece is missing. So that's when I started to learn that. I taught myself graphic design, growth marketing, content, all the things. So by the time I graduated, I'd started doing like part-time work in that field so I could learn about it. Fell in love with marketing, decided to pursue it full-time after college. But be it a blessing or a curse, I had not had a marketing internship. I didn't study marketing, so I felt really behind. And so when it came to a client base, I had no idea what to do. And I also did not know how to sell my work or my creativity. And I was so early career. What expertise could I even speak to, right? I wanted to figure out what aspect of marketing I wanted to specialize in, if I wanted to specialize in what industry. So that's where the marketing consulting business came about. It started as just a fractional like entry level marketer. I didn't charge a lot. I just wanted to learn as much as possible. And then I started raising my prices accordingly. But I built a really strong word of mouth led business. I didn't run a single ad. I didn't do any outbound. Honestly, I was 22. I had no idea how to do that. People would say, hey, love the work you've been doing. I know you've been working with so-and-so. They referred me to you. I didn't have a word for it yet or a term, but it started teaching me about this idea of like personal branding or brand reputation and just how crucial it can be. All I had to go off of and all my referrals had to go off of was what people were saying about me and the work that I was doing. And so I think above all else, that taught me that regardless of any other tactic that I lean into in this role and a future role, my work ethic and my ability to cultivate like word of mouth referrals is going to be crucial. It feels ironic that you didn't have any ads or anything like that's the whole thing, right? With marketing, yeah. uh, but incredible that your work ethic really spoke for itself. I would imagine before you started getting more clients, there's this putting yourself out there 
moment of, I am saying I'm an expert in this, but am I really an expert in this? Was there ever this time of you questioning that or did you have that confidence in yourself from the get-go? I actually never told people I was an expert in anything. The way I would approach it was, hey, I just graduated from college. I'm working for this company full-time, but I'm also really looking to grow in these areas of marketing. Here's my experience as of late, but I see that you need help with this. <laughs> would this be of any interest to you? How can I best support you? And I, I'm glad I went about it that way because if I had gone about it saying I'm an expert, I would be over-promising and under-delivering for mm -hmm. sure. Being honest with these people that I wanted to work with and these brands that I wanted to partner with, I think helped me build trust from the get-go. I still keep elements of that to this day with my agency. Obviously, I do consider myself an expert in this space now, but if there's something that I don't know or that I'm going to bring in a senior consultant for, I'm honest about that. That transparency has really helped build trust too. It ties into what we say on the sales side, a lot of pointing out the pain points, like coming in and not being, oh, me, 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 here's what I can do, but here's what I see as a problem for your business. And now here's how I can help with that. Looking back in those early days, do you have a brand you worked on that you can talk through a case study of you being really proud of one of those projects? Yeah, actually my very first one, my friend Brianna, she was my roommate freshman year. She dropped out beginning of junior to start Red Light Rebellion, which helps to eradicate child sex trafficking through education and awareness for parents and for children. And we were both just figuring it out. Honestly, she was the founder and I started off just producing creative content, mainly photography and videography, but quickly realized that there was that need for marketing. There weren't marketing strategy calls. We never sat down and built out a marketing plan, but it was a lot. We spent a lot of time researching and understanding who do you want to talk to? Why do you want to talk to them? What do they need to know? How do we convince schools of the importance of this, that you can come in and speak about it? How do you speak to the kids, right? Because even that's a bit of a marketing play. How do you get them to actually sit and listen? What is success? How are we tracking all of that? Having to essentially build that business from scratch from a marketing perspective, it definitely laid the foundation for how I approach doing it for startups now. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible mission and incredible thing to be a part of early on. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Verbatim. This is the company that you founded about a year ago, and it's a creative marketing agency that specializes in helping SMBs grow. I can imagine why there's this tie to the SMB space, but I don't want to make any assumptions. So tell me a little bit more about how the company got started, the idea you had for it, and where you are today. I love verbatim, I love building it. So I love the name, by the way. Thank you. It's, it makes a lot of sense, and it's also not something you see every day. If I ever shut down the agency, I think my next role will just be naming things for people because I have way too much fun with it. I Probably love Probably could have used your help with the podcast. <laughs> I went through so many names. It's so, tough, it's really, it's really so tough. tough. Well, with Verbatim, like I said, when I graduated from college, I hadn't studied marketing. So I wanted to dive into as many industries as I could, learn as much as I could. That ended up panning out with me working at a bunch of really lean, fast paced startups. So it was either I was the marketing team or maybe I had a small team that I was leading and I loved it. Did I burn out constantly? Yes, because I had no boundaries in place, but I really enjoyed it. I love the fast paced nature of it. I love being so hands on and knowing that each decision you're making is actually impacting the growth of this company and you can see it happen in front of you. Whenever I would have budget to work with an agency, I would either have a really good experience or maybe a not so good experience. Most often I would leave an agency partnership feeling like it was just fine. It wasn't great. I don't refer them, but it was fine. Working in tech for so long, I also started to work with more and more agencies and I was getting ready to launch for beta. I sat down and I thought about what it is that I wanted in an agency. And I wanted flexibility. I wanted an agency that would just help. I understand you have to have a scope of work and you have to have contracts, but when you work in startups or small businesses, you're wearing a lot of hats. What you need this week might change to next week. And I just really wanted that flexibility of an actual agency partner that informed the mission, but that also informed who I wanted to work with. Back to my earlier point, I just really, really enjoy watching companies grow and playing a significant role in that. I'm sure you've seen the signs sometimes when you go to like a locally owned business and it says, your purchase today is 
what's letting me like take my daughter to her recital yeah. or something like that. I just think there's so much value in empowering small and mid-sized businesses and startups with a really strong mission to grow and to take their piece of the pie. How do you find those new clients or are they coming to you at this point? I started posting on LinkedIn in March, 2022, back when I was working in-house at a company. The content that I create for brands is always, you have a structure, you have a strategy, you have a plan. With LinkedIn, it was a lot different. We're just gonna write about my career and we'll have fun. When it stops being fun, we'll stop. <laughs> It has not stopped, so I'm going to keep going. But people have followed me on that journey, which has been really, really cool to see. And so I think the level of transparency that I bring to my content has let people get to know me a bit. Mm -hmm. When I launched Verbatim, and as it's continued to grow, brands have reached out. And it's basically an inbound motion right now. But we're going to start outbound in the next couple of months. By the way, I recommend everyone follow you on LinkedIn, regardless of the role, because it is really good content. So keep posting. I'm glad it's still fun. Thank you. you mentioned this yeah. a little bit earlier that you explore different industries and that's where this passion for the SMB space grew. Was that an intentional decision to diversify the industries you worked for versus specialize? It was actually very intentional. So I have always been challenged by this idea that you have to niche down into one industry and there were just so many industries that I didn't know anything about. So how do I know if I don't like them? And to that point, I also believe when you do diversify your industry expertise, you can apply what you've learned in one industry to another and bring a really fresh and diverse perspective to it. Over the years, I've learned what industries I just don't enjoy. Generally speaking, I do see a lot of value in diversifying. From your point of view, what's a mistake that you see marketers making or brands making time and time again? The one that immediately came to mind is assuming that A, you know everything about your customer or your ICP, or B, basically trying to turn yourself into your ICP. Like, well, I don't like this copy or I don't like this creative, so we're changing it. But you've actually done no research to see if it's something that resonates with your audience. It doesn't have to resonate with you. I do believe that after a certain point, as a marketer, you do start to develop like a gut feeling or an intuition. And you can start to put yourself in your customer's shoes pretty easily and pretty seamlessly. But that doesn't negate the fact that you need to talk to your customers, research your ICP, like understand who they actually are. Making assumptions, to be frank, is just a waste of money and resources. Mm -hmm. You said something a little earlier around you posting more on LinkedIn. That was an active decision. But you kind of give yourself that out. Like, if it's not fun anymore, I'll stop posting, no big deal. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the idea of putting yourself out there and building a personal brand as it ties in also to a podcast that you have, Stop the Scroll, again, great name, trying new things, putting yourself out there, building your brand, whether we're outwardly trying to do that in a platform like a LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, or it's more of a, I just want people to think of me a certain way at work and know that I can do certain things at work. What are your thoughts on all that? I do see a lot of value in creating content online and building an online brand. I will say it might not be fun at first. So I've been writing and creating content for years. I'm used to it. I enjoy it, but that doesn't come naturally for a lot of people because it's not what they spend their days doing. Whether it's video content, written content, whatever medium you choose, it might feel unnatural for a while. Or that doesn't mean that you're always going to feel that way. And it doesn't mean that it's not effective. Give yourself the time and the runway to actually learn from it and try different mediums, try different topics, see what resonates with you and the audience that you want to build. One thing I see a lot, especially on LinkedIn, is that you need to diversify, you need to be on multiple platforms, you need to be posting like this much content per week. I think all that's a little rigid, I'll be honest. We have lives, we have jobs. My full-time job is not a content creator. If I can't post for a week because I'm working with clients, I see no problem with that. Finding a way to fit content creation and personal branding into your life rather than letting it become your life is really, really important because that's also where a lot of the burnout can come from. Making sure you have that balance, but figuring out what that balance is for you and not letting somebody else with different goals and a different business model dictate that for you. Along the lines of that burnout, I'm going to date us when this actually gets released, but this is very topical right now. You know, the very demure, very mindful 
<laughs> thing going around. Which, by the way, I am so not socially focused. I, that's probably <laughs> obvious in the terms that I just used. But as a brand with your clients, do you feel the pressure to stay trendy and hop on the bandwagon of certain trends that are going on to capitalize something in the moment? Or do you try to really stay authentic to the voice of the brand? And how do you balance that? That is a great question because I do see a lot of marketers and brands talking about this or struggling with it. To be honest, I think it's really easy for a leadership team to look at a marketer, social media manager specifically, and be like, hey, this trend is going on. You need to be capitalizing on this. Like, why aren't you posting about this? Mm -hmm. Well, we're a plumbing company, so I don't really think <laughs> this doesn't really apply to our audience, you know? And so to that point, no, to answer your question, I don't feel that pressure, but I do believe that's because I've built up trust with my clients. They trust my opinion. They trust my expertise. There is value in leveraging trends that are happening if it is relevant or interesting to your audience, which goes back to understanding your audience. Like what you think is funny or innovative, they might think is very odd or they have no idea what trend you're even talking about. Knowing who you're speaking to first and foremost is what is going to allow you to remain authentic. And then if it makes sense at that point, yeah, jump on the trend, jump on the bandwagon, have fun with it. And part of being a marketer is being able to do that quickly. So the research phase should be done. You should know within a day, two days of a trend going live, this is something we want to hop on. Because otherwise the trend's over by the time you actually put anything out. Which it's over and then you just look weird. Mindful. Yeah. <laughs> it's not demure. It's not cutesy. You're yeah. Behind. And to that point too, it's just so cringy when a brand hops on a trend and it just doesn't make sense. Even right. if you're not chronically online, as the kids like to say. See, I've not kids. even heard that. <laughs> Socially but... focused, as you said. Mm -hmm. They can see a trend, see a brand hopping on the bandwagon and be like, mm, that doesn't really land. And mm -hmm. you don't want to be that, that brand either. How do you identify what your audience is and what they want to see? Is that when people come to you? Yes, that's when they come to me. So one part of it is research. Another part is in a perfect world interviews. What I do personally is I essentially try my best to become the customer. I start searching online as if I'm them. What podcasts are they listening to? What Newsletters are they subscribing to? What thought leaders do they engage with? Are they scrolling on their phones or are they only using their computer? Um, how do they work? Are they using pen and paper every day or are they online using Asana or Google Sheets? I try to step into their shoes as much as possible and understand what kind of content resonates with them in the first place and who they're seeking out. And then I learn from the people that they engage with as well. That's really helpful similar to sales roles. Like there's a lot of tie in here with the personas that you're reaching out to and figuring out mm. who you're talking to, not just what you're talking about. So you can't put the cart before the horse in some of these areas or else the outcome isn't gonna be what you want. Yeah, and where you want to talk about each thing. Like what you talk about on Instagram might be a lot different than what you talk about on LinkedIn. And so making sure you have that balance and understand what content goes where is crucial too. Fascinating. What has been your proudest personal and professional accomplishment? I would say my proudest professional accomplishment has been launching verbatim, not even like reaching certain revenue milestones, but taking the leap. I had thought for a long time about going out on my own full time and just kept putting it off. Like kept thinking I wasn't ready. And to a certain extent, at, a, at one point I wasn't ready. Like I did need to stay in house and learn some more. But then there comes that time when you just have to make the leap and put certain things in place financially, professionally, all of that. But I'm really proud of myself for going after it. I'm learning a lot along the way. To your point, you're learning a lot still. Like you probably are never 120% ready, but you got things in order enough to feel like, okay, I can do this now. For me, it was a matter of understanding what my main fears and like hesitations were and then tackling those. So one was, I work in tech, layoffs are happening left and right, I get that. But my full-time job still feels more stable than going out on my own. So what do I need to set up financially so that I feel comfortable doing this? And then from there, what do I want to start capturing like referrals now? How do I want to prioritize outbound sales, things like that? Getting some form of a plan in place was the next step. There was still this preparing involved 
And I think that that's important to note because for me personally, sometimes I see founders, I'm like, oh, she probably always knew she wanted to do it and then just did it one day. But there's still this preparing time. You can't get so excited about an idea that you forget to do the research and put things in order to make it successful. It's funny you say that because I've often felt that way about other founders. I'm like, wow, they just hit the ground running. They woke up on Tuesday, had the idea, launched it on Thursday and like yeah. hit a million in revenue. This is crazy. But then I look at my own journey and I'm like, well, I thought about launching an agency three years ago and then put it on the back burner. And then 2023 happened and I hired a coach and started actually planning it out and preparing. Everybody's journey is different. Some people do just launch and I love that for them. But one thing I've learned is it is okay to take your time and to build it in a way that makes sense for you. Mm-hmm. My husband would say, measure twice, cut once. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And I usually roll my eyes at him. So embarrassed that I said it just now. What about proudest personal accomplishment? Graduating from college. I'm first generation American. I didn't study what anybody really, you know, wanted me to study. And college was hard. Like I was in the honors college studying film, which is a very weird combination. And it was just stressful and I was working. There was just a lot happening at once. I was also young. I started college when I was 16, moved out and lived at the dorms. And it just felt like a lot to balance as a young adult or I guess a teenager at that point. But I am proud of myself for for getting through it. You were 16 when you started college? 16. How does that yeah, work? I, want... <laughs> I think I skipped like first and second grade or first and third. And then I was always just a little bit younger. You skipped because you were that far ahead or? Yeah, my mom loves to tell this story. (laughs) She says when they were learning how to write the alphabet in kindergarten, I I was already writing stories. So she went to the principal and she's like, this isn't working. She knows the alphabet and She's (laughs) bored. Move her up. So I'm very grateful to her for advocating for me. You said that you are a first generation American. Where is your family from? My mom is from Jamaica. She moved to Brooklyn, New York when she was 13 or 14 with her family. And my dad's side is from Liberia. I'm sure they're so proud of you, even if film was not (laughs) what they had in the cards for you. I would say if you ever needed a defense to your mom, we can blame her because she (laughs) called out your writing ability from a young age and had you moved up in class. She asked for this. She did. What is something you know now that you wish your early career self would have known? I wish I would have known about mentorship earlier on. So I didn't really even hear the term until I was maybe 24, 25. Um, And it's been very helpful. Like having mentors has been great. I'm mentoring students from my alma mater. I love watching people grow and also seeing the fruits of that for myself. But I wish I would have known about that when I was graduating and trying to figure all of this out. It felt like I had to do a lot of it alone or resort to Google for these like random complex questions. Before chat, GPT. (laughs) Right? Like where was chat back then? I really could have used it. But there's just so much value in it. And there's so many resources now that are just great ways to like get outside of your bubble and learn from other people that are a few steps ahead of you or many steps ahead on that same note communities too. I wish I had really leaned into marketing communities, communities for people of color, just to find some camaraderie and also learn from more people. 